Let praise the Lord. Carry your candle and go light your world. Praise the Lord. South. I'm carrying the candle. Africa, go to Europe, go to America, and go to India, go to China, go everywhere. Light, carry the light. Name. And uh, you know, when you go like that, your wife will not, you know, you go to America, for example, and then your wife is uh, tying the cap like tie in El Conano. And then uh, they say, Which one is this? That's not part of the light. You appear like them. You dress like them. You cover your nakedness, but you dress like them. And when you go to places, you don't show them that your own kind of, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, things you do, your gari and your amala, your whatever it is, that that is what they are going to eat there. That's not the gospel. You take the gospel to them, but you dress it up in a way they will understand. That's why as I'm talking about, uh, you know, missions tonight and a mission-minded church. That's why I came, so that, you know, the South-South people, where are you, South-South, where are you? Where is South-South? Come on now, get home. South-South, where are you? I think we should sing a EBBO and sing an FA and sing, praise the Lord. Tonight we are going to carry our candles and we are going to light the world. Choir, oh, yes, thank you very much. You just know the appropriate song every time you sing. Praise the Lord. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight and bless your name and glorify you. Thank God, thank you, Lord, because of these voices that prophetically sing to us and they tell us and command us and they, and they encourage us and counsel us. Carry your candle and go light the world. You are spoken through them. We are going to do that in Jesus' name. I pray for every brother, every sister here. I pray that you anoint us tremendously in Jesus' name. That the power of the gospel will go through us and nothing of our own tradition, nothing of our own kind of background will hinder the penetration of the gospel anywhere and everywhere we go in Jesus' name. You have raised us up with the gospel with your spirit. And you have told us to go into all parts of the world. When we're in India, we're not going to be dressing and acting like people in a village in Nigeria. And when we go to America, when we go to Europe, or go to all these places, Lord, we just pray you show us the appropriate way to be able to bring the gospel to them, and they will receive the gospel appropriately in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that anything that will hinder the preaching of the gospel and the penetration propagation of the gospel through us, because of our lack of understanding, we pray that you take everything away in Jesus' name. Bless your people tonight and make us a general blessing to everybody we meet in our world in Jesus' name. Lord, this candle you have given us, this light you have given us, we're not going to hide it on the bushel. We're going to carry this and lighten the world, enlighten the people that will come across all over the world in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you because we know we are going to see the result. It will be done in Jesus' name. We thank you for everything, Lord, in Jesus' name. We pray. Thank you very much. We can see that we're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You will see that immediately when Jesus gave up this great commission, just before he left them, he left the disciples. He told them, it's going to be a dynamic church because he shall say power. The Holy Ghost is going to be like a dynamite, dynamis, and that will make us dynamic and powerful and fervent. And then he says it's going to be a mission-minded church. It's not going to remain just in Jerusalem or just in Judea or in Samaria. It's going to go to the uttermost part of the earth. That's why the Lord is talking to us tonight that we need to have some virtues. 
I want you to have the vision. I want you to understand that the calling the Lord has given us is not just to this locality or that locality. It's going to get everywhere and we're going to get there in Jesus' name. And then eventually the Holy Ghost came upon them. And do you know that the day the Holy Ghost came upon those people, upon those 120 disciples and apostles that were waiting, it was in a, mission, in a missionary kind of setting. Look at this in Acts chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 5. Already we know that we were sitting together in one place with one accord, and the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave utterance. Look at verse 5. It says, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. It was at the feast of our Pentecost, and people came from all over the world, and it says, Out of every nation under heaven. Why is it that the Almighty God waited that all those nations came together before He poured the Spirit of God upon them? Because He wanted them to know that this feeling of the Holy Ghost, our calling of the Holy Ghost, is not just for Jerusalem or just for Israel. That's why He got all those people together during the feast of, of uh, this Pentecost, and He says they came from various places. Look at this line, verse 8. He said, And how hear we, every man, in our own tongue, wherein we were born. You see, when people, when they hear the language in which they were born, they hear the message in that language, it gets to their heart. If you speak to them in a large language, in a second language, it goes into their head. And if they, they're trying to find out, they try to translate and transmit that message into their language before they can understand. But then the Holy Ghost came. And the Holy Ghost symbolized and it showed them that this is the way the gospel should be preached. That we are going to speak to them in their very language in which they were born. And they were told now of the people that were there. Mission-minded church, dynamic mission-minded church. The people that we need to reach. The Parthians, verse 9. And Medes, and Elamites, and dwellers of Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and in Cappadocia, and in Pontus, and in Asia, and then in Syphrygia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, in parts of Libya, about, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and Proselytes, Greeks, and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful words of God. We do hear them speak what surprised them. What interested them, what attracted them, is that we are hearing them speak in our own tongue. But you know, if you go to a particular place and you dress strangely, they have never seen that kind of dressing like that. And you tie, your, and your wife ties the head strangely, they have never seen anything like this before. And then you begin to preach something. When those nationals try to join, their people, their relatives to be saying, you are going to join a cult. You are going to join a sect. Because they never seen this kind of appearance before. That's why if you go on missionary work, you look at the people there, you look at their culture there, you look at their dressing there, you look at the kind of things they eat over there, and then you, you try to be like them. You cover your nakedness, you do everything properly and appropriately, but you look like them much of the time, so that they will know that this is really part of us. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus, the incarnation of Jesus, he became like us. And he didn't speak the language of the angels. When he was uh, talking to the people, he spoke in the language, in the language they understood. In fact, he was saying, how does this man know letters? Have you never gone to school? Because the way they ought to speak and the way they ought to do everything, that's the way he did everything with them. He even kept their law. He kept everything except the ones that contradicted the will of God and the word of God and the proper spiritual interpretation of the word of God. That's the same way saying that if we're going to actually do missionary work, we need to have some orientation, some change of mind, some change of attitude, and some better understanding. We're looking at verse 41 of that chapter, chapter 2 of Acts. Then they that gladly received his word, who are the day? If they were read about from Patria, from Medes, from Egypt, from Libya, from Cyrene, from all those places, from Philia. Those were the people. They gladly received the word. The first church was a missionary minded church. And he got members from all these places, converts from all these places. It says they were baptized and then they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Let's look at Acts chapter 8. 
We're looking at verse 4. When persecution scattered them all over, it says, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad, which were, tell me out loud, everywhere preaching the word. Preaching the word. But you know, if you're going to preach the word to people, you must not look strange and look queer. And then the people are wondering, and they are thinking about your strange appearance rather than the word of God you are trying to preach. That's why some of our people have gone on missionary work for so many years, and if there's nothing happening there, you know, we're still maybe about 100 or 150 since we left, and sometimes even that small number, the majority of them are the people that are from Nigeria here, they are Nigerians in diaspora, that they are over there, and then they Oh, deeper life is, and then many people, many of our members over there are people that got converted in Nigeria, and then they traveled, and then they saw that our church is there, and they joined. But if we're going to do missionary work, you're reaching the people who are there, you're reaching the nationals who are there, you're reaching the indigenous who are there. If you're going to reach the indigenous, we must make sure that we understand what the gospel is all about, and then we must make sure that there's a difference between Nigerian culture and the gospel, Nigerian dressing and the gospel, Nigerian appearance and the gospel, Nigerian food stuff and the gospel, Nigerian language and the gospel. Let's say, for example, you're a missionary, and then you go to a particular country, and then people are coming together, they're coming to the church, and then we have Yorubas there, because Yorubas, they travel everywhere, we have Igbos there, they travel everywhere, we have epic people there, they travel everywhere, and after the service, the, you know, epic people are there, then in another land, in another country, maybe they're in Europe, maybe they're in America, maybe they're in Canada, but after the service, all the epic people will gather and be speaking ethic. All the Yoruba people who got to us speaking Yoruba. All the Igbo people in that fellowship far away in Europe of America and they're speaking the Igbo language and then the nationals that come they say, well, this looks like an African church. Because they don't even recognize that we are here. They understand English, they can speak English, but they are so wedded and so married to their local language. And many of those people will not come anymore. That's why if we're going to do missionary work, you change your mind, you change your attitude. And then everything that we do will show that we are mission-minded people, indispensable virtues. They are virtues we need. They are indispensable. They are essential. They are compulsory. They are they are non-negotiables. We cannot deal without them. That's the reason why you want to reconsider tonight if your mind is thinking of mission or if you're on the mission field already. How are you going to do it with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind? And you really want to sacrifice. When we say we lay down something, you know there are people that don't understand consecration. Consecration, when we say lay down this, pray the Lord, I lay down this, I'm selfless, I don't have self, I don't have that. Can you lay down your local language? Now you put some embargo on yourself that I'm going to the missionary field and any time I appear in the public, I'm going to lay down my local language. I'm going to lay down the peculiarities of my tradition, the peculiarities of my tribe, the peculiarities of my background. I lay everything down. It's just like, for example, now there's somebody who is uh, a professor and there is a professor. He studied maybe mathematics and chemistry, biology or whatever it is. All these science subjects. Or maybe he's computer literate and all he knows is about computer. And then he says I have a calling and God calls him to go and minister in the village. He needs to now sacrifice, he needs to consecrate, he needs to surrender. What's he surrendering? All that knowledge about computer, all that knowledge about chemistry, all that knowledge about the you know, zones and everything. When you come to those farmers, if you're talking, and all your illustrations because of your background, you have not consecrated, you have not laid that background down. And then you're talking to them, and all the illustrations about computer, about the chips, about a base, about that, about electronics, and they are laws. And they say, What's he doing? Does he want to come and just demonstrate that it been a uh, you know university a university done or whatever it is? What's he doing? Why is he talking like this? I don't understand. Do you know that when Jesus came to this world, all his illustration, of course, he could have given illustrations about Lucifer, illustration about angels, illustration about his situation with the Father, illustration about all those cabinets and all those mansions in heaven, illustrations about the street of gold. But no, a farmer went out to sow. A fisherman threw the net into the river and then a woman was trying to make, bake a bread and they put leaven there and then there was uh, this person a publican that came and said this
this and that, and the Pharisee came. The illustrations they could understand. Jesus Christ laid down everything. You lay down your knowledge. You lay down your peculiarities. You lay down your tribal identification. When you lay all that down, and the characteristics and peculiarities of your background, everything is, and that's what we call consecration. If you're going to be a missionary, we're going to be that in Jesus' name. And so if you're not able to lay all that down, you know, this is just me, this is just me, I'm coming from, uh, you know, such and such a place, and in that place, and you're bragging about it, right? that the people don't even appreciate, you're bragging about that. It's not going to help anybody. We're talking about the virtues we ought to have. We're talking about the characteristics we ought to have, and the kind of lifestyle you ought to have, so that we'll be able to reach people, we'll not be repelling the people we ought to attract into the gospel. Three points we're going to look at. At number one, the heavenly vision of a mission minded church. The heavenly vision of a mission minded church. Number two, the heart searching virtues. Heart searching virtues from a mission minded church. And then number three, the harmonious voice of a mission minded church. The harmonious voice, united voice of a mission minded church. Number one, the heavenly vision of a mission minded church. We're looking at Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, I'm reading there from verse, I'm reading from verse 19. Acts chapter 26, we're looking at verse 19. In verse 19 here is what we see from Paul the Apostle, wherefore, o King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the, unto the heavenly vision. I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. How did he carry out that heavenly vision? Look at it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Because he knew that he had a vision, he had a goal. He was not going to allow his own tribal sentiments to hinder that vision. If the vision is important, if the vision is a priority, if the vision is number one in your life, you are going to consider the vision above yourself. Above your own peculiarities, above your own tradition, above your own tribal identification, above anything that, you know, I love this, I love, what is the consecration? If you're not able to give up those things you love and those things you like, so that these, the people that God has called you to minister to, they will see that you are like them. You appear like them. You talk like them. You learn their way of life. And then you are able to bring the gospel unto them. And that's why Paul the Apostle said that what I've done is, I look at the heavenly vision and I wet myself and I wedge myself, and I attach myself, and I focus on that heavenly vision, and whatever I need to give up, even things that are good for me, I have to give them up so that I can fulfill the calling the Lord has given me. First Corinthians chapter 9, I'm reading there from verse 19. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, though, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all. He said, I make myself servant unto to all, I count them as the master. I don't count myself as the master. I don't say, I want to come and teach them that this is the way. And when that is not part of the gospel, I said, I just keep the gospel pure and simple. Any other sin that relates to their lifestyle, their appearance, or the way they eat, or whatever it is, I'm going to make them the master. I'm going to say, I'm your servant. I'm here to serve you. And because I'm here to serve you, I will allow you to dictate to me the areas you feel that this is the way and this is the way. But when it comes to the gospel, that's where you're a master builder. That's where you lay the foundation because other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But in this verse 19, though I be free from all men, yet I, may, I have made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. You see that? Your purpose is to gain them, is to win their souls. Your purpose is not to repel them, it's not to push them away. Your purpose is not to show them that, hey, you have a bad culture. Hey, you ought to go to Nigeria and know how to dress. You ought to go to my village and know how to tie a scarf. You ought to go to my place and know how to put this. To... No, you are there to serve them. And because you are there to serve them, you are not coming with your preconceived idea. Look at verse 10. And unto the Jews, I became as a Jew. Are you going to become as a Jew if you don't dress like a Jew when you are in their midst? 
If you don't eat the things they eat, you know there are people that shall they go to another place, another country, they never learn how to eat what they eat over there. And they send it back to Nigeria. I'm starving here. There is no food here at all. What do you mean there's no food? I'm saying I didn't see snail here since I got to this country. Uh -huh, that is food. That is food. And because he has not seen snail since he got to that country, there is no food in that country. You see that? But when you live, that's part of what we sacrifice. There are people that have to sacrifice things. In fact, even sometimes, there are times you have to sacrifice the things that, are, that you are used to. Let's say, for example, you are taking too much eggs and eggs and eggs, and your cholesterol is coming up. And then you go to see the doctor, and the doctor said, Hey, you are dying. Because once this thing, the thing gets to a cry level, you are gone. I said, Doctor, what will I do? Don't touch eggs any any time in any form for the rest of your life. Because you want to live, that's how you kind of you take away that. Or there are some people that you take salt and salt every time. And when they give you for real, there's enough salt there already. You say, give me that bottle. And then you pour it heavy on it. And then eventually you're having this. I don't know how my heart is feeling. I don't know about this. You see the doctor and then you say, hey, it's, it's a surprise to us here alive that your blood pressure is this high. In fact, to even say that to walk here, this is a miracle. You are a walking miracle. But you must get rid of salt completely. Not just immediately, completely. If you want to live because of that physical life you want to preserve, you get, you get rid of that if you want the people to have eternal life. Why don't you then understand? Although this is sweet, although this is appealing, Although this is what I'm used to, I'm going to get rid of them. And it is when you do that, you really have the mind of a missionary. But if you don't do that and just yourself, the people, the people will not come. And if we leave you there, the people are going to die in their sin. That's why it says in verse 20, to the Jews, I became as a Jew. That I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are without law, as without law, be not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law, to the weak I become as weak. When it says to the weak here, I become as weak, he already explained that in the epistle to the Romans. He said, the people who are weak, they take herbs. And the people who are strong, they say we can eat anything because the Lord has set us free. No clean animal, unclean animal, give it to me, I will eat it. And what Paul the Apostle, he was free. He was free. He said, I'm not under the law anymore. I'm not under, this one is clean animal, unclean animal. You, you cook it this way, cook it that way. He said, that's what we did with the Jews. And when he went to the Jewish people, he will still keep that part of the law. The things that are clean, he will eat. The things that are not clean, he will not eat. Not before a Jewish person. When he went to the Gentile field, then he said, what is it to have there? He ate whatever they gave him. He did not say, no, I cannot eat that. He said to the Jews, I'm like a Jew. And to those who are not Jewish, they are Gentiles, I'm like a Gentile. Then he tells us in, in this uh, verse 22, that I might gain the weak. I, I have made my, I, I have made all things to all men, that by all means I should save some. He said, I do that so that I can save souls. If you count the Great Commission more important than your pet ideas, if you count the Great Heavenly Vision more important than your uh, peculiarities, then you are going to give up all those things. Wherever you are, you will think, what do they do here? How do they do this here? How do they do this here? And then when you are just yourself like that, everything will be all right. And I pray that God will give us wisdom and intelligence to do the work of the Lord the way we ought to do it in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen. So that's what the Lord is telling us, that we need to have that same idea. And let's come to Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. It says, And the angel, and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward, this, uh, go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is a desert. 
And then it says, and he arose and went, and, and behold, a man of Ethiopia. It's not a man of Israel. It's not a man of Canaan. It's not a man of, you know, that he was familiar with. A man of Ethiopia. You see, you have to be very sensitive to people. And then you understand, just like you are very serious about your tradition, the Ethiopian is serious about his tradition too. Just like you appreciate your own local language, the Ethiopian also appreciates his local language. Just like you all know you appreciate the tradition of our fathers because here we are and this is how we do things. The same way that Ethiopian appreciates the tradition of his own fathers too. And he's going to tell you history, centuries of history. How we did this and we did this and we did this and we did that. And you think that everybody appreciates, you know, the language you are speaking. You know, uh, there are some people, they feel that you, their language, when we get to heaven, we're going to be speaking their language. They just know that... My language is the most beautiful on earth. That's the way everybody thinks. You think like that, I think like that, she thinks like that, and he thinks like that. And when you come before people, and then you project that. My culture is the most important, and is the most beautiful in the world. The way I do things is the most beautiful in the world. And then when you now meet an Ethiopian, and you project that. First of all, he says that you are so proud. You are looking down here. You know, he is not even seeing your Christ. He is seeing your tradition. He is not seeing the gospel you are preaching. He is seeing the culture that you are trying to bring. And he doesn't know the difference between your culture and the gospel. Because even you yourself, you don't make any difference between your culture and the gospel. And if people take the gospel, they repent of their sins, they are born again. The things that the Bible calls sin, that the gospel calls sin, that in the, in the epistles, it calls sin. When people have repented, they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you are watching them. They have not done it the way you are doing it. They have not kept your culture. And then you now penalize them. Because although they have got the gospel, they didn't get your culture. You are putting your culture line uh, side by side with the gospel. Isn't that why many of us will say, I don't want to have anything to do with the Catholic Church. Because they put what, what the Pope says. The same side by side with what the Bible says. All those extra things that the Pope has said, that all the opposed from generation to generation have said, they put all that beside the gospel. And they say they are of equal weight. They are of equal value. You are doing the same thing that you put your culture or you put your own village tradition side by side with the gospel that when the people you go to on the mission field when they have got the gospel but they have not imbibed your culture you see they are not serious they didn't accept the truth they didn't accept the doctrine i think they get me out of this place and get me back home so that i can go back where i'll be able to really preach and people will come to the lord but they came to the lord you are the one driving them away because you are putting culture and gospel together you don't have any demarcation in your own mind any understanding in your mind between the culture and the gospel i pray god will give us wisdom and then we go out and really reach the people. And you know that uh, even here we can have that challenge and that problem. You know, thank God that, uh, you know, our people that come from different parts of the world, they look at how we are here and they say, well, we're in Lagos, we're in Nigeria. So let us appear like the Nigerians. But you know, there are differences. If you go to Ghana, you're going to see, even though we have Nigeria, we have Ghana, uh, the next country that speaks English, you're going to see that the way they tie their rapper, the women is very different from the way we do it in Nigeria here. Here. And uh, thank God, many of them they still they do it their own way when they come over here. And uh, but there are some people that will go to them right at the Congress and say, Ah, are you not uh, are you not a deeper life person? Are you tying apart like this? Is that gospel? I said, Is that gospel? That's why many of us will be useless when we go to missionary field. If you go to Namibia and see the way those women put on uh, their head covering, it will, it will be strange to you, but it's normal to them. The important thing is to cover their head. And their, their grandparents did that, and their parents did that, and they are doing that. And then you go there and you are saying that, you know, after the repentance, and after this, and after that, you Namibians, this is the way to cover it, so that we can look like the people in Nigeria. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. Make a difference between the gospel and the tradition that you are holding. And that's what the Lord is telling us today, that you have to become 
missionary minded. It takes a conversion, another kind of conversion, that now your mind, your heart is converted so much that you're willing to beg and you're willing to bow and you're willing to submit to the situation and circumstance around where you are to be able to minister to them. And I pray God will give us that dedication in Jesus' name. I'm now looking at chapter 8 of Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, and then it says uh, he was in verse, in verse 28, he was returning and sitting in his chariot, read, uh, he read Esaias the prophet, and then we're told, and then the Spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot, and Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the uh, prophet Esaias, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? Then he opened, he desired Philip to, uh, that he would come up and sit with him. Look up here. You know, just that. Uh, you know, sometimes the people are not very conscious. There are different parts of, many parts of the world. You know, in some parts of the world, there is a particular distance you need to live between you and the next person you are talking to. In some cultures, you ought to be very near. In some cultures, if you are too near, they say you are forward. They say you are prognosing. They say, why is he so near? He's acting familiar. I'm just meeting him for the first time and then see how close he is. You must be very sensitive uh, to the people where you are. And then eventually he said, come and sit with me in the church. And Philip filled with the Holy Ghost. Philip, a miracle worker. Philip, a man that had great gifts of signs and wonders. He didn't dare. So when, the, when the angel, when the spirit said, join yourself to this child, he didn't just climb up and then sit by his side and say, I have something to tell you. He respected the culture of the man until the man invited him. You, when you get to a place, there are books that are already reaching. And those books will tell you the etiquette of that place. And it will tell you the behavior of the people at that, in that place. If you go to the Middle East, for example, where our brother who just preached now, where he's a missionary, you know, there, there are things that you just don't complain about. I think our brother will remember. We went to a particular place because I went for conferences and programs there. And I'm telling you, as we walked in there, all the cows and all the moose and all the camels, they were all that. And all their ways, everything was on the ground because that's the situation there. And then when we when were going to eat there, the benches on where we were sitting, the people who are bringing the bread, they carry the bread like this to their chairs. I didn't know whether they have washed their clothes, you know, for one whole month. Looking at them, I can sense that these people, I don't think uh, they understand hygiene the way I understand hygiene, but hygiene in that place is different from hygiene over here. And therefore, they carry it. And then on the seat, on the benches, a brother will remember where we were going to, where we were going to sit, they put the bread there. And then they add this, um, you know, uh, this um, kind of soup that is drawing with all this uh, green uh, leaf and everything. They put it on the table for everybody, not one by one. And there were no other plates. And you know, where uh, you then you take your bread from that bench and you have to pray. <laughs> I said you have to pray. Because if you drink any anything, it will not hurt you. If you eat any anything, it will hurt you. And all of us, we dip that bread inside that drawing soup. Uh, the same thing for everybody. Number one, to even take the bread, I thought you take bread with, uh, with eggs. No, that's our culture. That's Western culture. That's not there in that place. And I thought that we should have place one by one. We should have night. We didn't have all that. We just took it and broke it. And then uh, when we put it in the mouth, then we want to take the next bite. We put, we're put in the mouth. We're putting it back into that something again. That was it. That's the way they did it. And that's the way, praise the Lord, I did it for them. Did I become sick? Never. I just accepted how it was. If you're going to have missionary mind, that's what you should do. But I'm not going to tell you. Miracles took place in that, in that meeting. The pastor 
had just one daughter. I think her brother will remember. And that, past, the, that one daughter was already 11 years of age. And then before I left that place, you know, the pastor said, this is the only daughter that was 11 years old already. And we want other children. I said, husband and wife knew and we prayed. And uh, you know, before I got back again to Egypt, you know, the woman was pregnant already. I'm telling you that well, if you just forget your culture and just forget wherever it is and you don't oppose anything and you don't contradict anything, I'm saying that when you respect the culture of the people and just bring the gospel to them with the love of God, they are going to accept it in Jesus' name. And then many people will turn to the Lord and great will be your joy and your success in ministry in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me go to point number two now, which is the heart searching virtues from a missionary minded church. A mission minded church has such virtues, the kind of virtues we ought to have. There are people that have vision, but don't have virtue. They have vision, they don't have virtue. And they're all for the going, go getters. They want to get it. But the virtues, they're very important. As we mix uh, with these people, we're looking at Second, second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. Second Peter chapter 1. We're looking at it from verse 3. It says, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. Whereby, you remember, he has called us to glory, he has called us to virtue. He has called us to glory and we get to that glory through the pathway of virtue. He has called us to success. We get to that success through the pathway of virtue. He has called us to have dominion. We get to that dominion through the pathway of virtue. That's why it says He's called us to glory and virtue. In verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these He might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through laws. And beside this, giving all diligence, what kind of diligence? All diligence, add to your faith, what? Virtue. Add to your faith, virtue. You know, I have faith, I about being virtuous. I about being virtuous. Add to your faith, virtue. And you see, it, people from different places, they, they see the way they interpret virtue. And then when you're in a particular community, what do these people count as virtue? What do they count as righteousness? I mean, normal things, just the etiquette and just the way the people live. You see, our definition of holiness, there's a basic definition of holiness. And that, by the grace of God, we have it, we'll never lose it in Jesus' name. Our definition of purity, we have it by the grace of God, we'll never lose it in Jesus' name. But when you move from place to place and you go from territory to territory and country to country and you mix with different people from different perspectives and different backgrounds, there are some things they call virtue that you never thought about. I said, is that what's the importance of that? And what is, uh, you know, what has that got to do? Let's say, for example, you go to a community, a Muslim community. Let's, let's be very clear. You know, some of us see other religion. I understand that's all right. Uh, let's say you go to a, com a, a community of Muslims and their women normally don't come out. It doesn't matter. You, some of us are from the north. And you know that if a, a highly placed person is a professor but is a Muslim and is a politician but is a Muslim or is a very rich man but a Muslim, you never see the wife outside. That's, a, that's what they count as virtue. And their wives will never, never act familiar to anybody. That's what they call virtue. And if you go to minister in such a place and then uh, those uh, Muslim women, they are coming and they are getting converted. And just like, you know, Christian love and Christian fellowship, you are very familiar with them. They say, look at this pastor. Because even though they are born again, just like the Jewish people, they were born again. But their circumcision was still very important to them. And they are not eating unclean meat, and eating clean meat was still very important to them. And these people are coming from the background of Hinduism, coming from the background of Buddhism, coming from the background of Islam. Their tradition, what they learned before, and that one is neutral. Whether you are very close to a person or you are very far when you are talking, that's neutral. Whether you sit down together or you are signing up and the other fellow is sitting up, that's neutral. That has nothing to do. It's the condition of your heart. You may not be committing sin, but the people, they will say, 
What is the virtue of this man? Look at this man, the way he is for the people. And so, you need to be very sensitive when you go on mission field and you say that this is how the people behave and this is how they act because you may not know. Some of those little, little things, they hinder people from coming to your fellowship and from remaining and staying in the fellowship. I pray God will give us understanding. Say they must fight. It says, beside all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to virtue knowledge. What if you have the knowledge of, you know, computer and internet, but you don't have the knowledge of the people you are ministering to? You don't know how they think. You don't know what they feel. You don't know their history. You don't know the knowledge. If you know them, your illustrations will be really much to them. And your quoting of the scriptures will be really much unto them. And we had, uh, you, know, you know, the way we sometimes uh, preach in our, in our retreats, in our conferences over here in Nigeria. And we went to a particular place and, uh, uh, to, pre to preach. And uh, it was during the retreat period. I wasn't preaching at that time. Another person was preaching. But what was what simultaneous interpretation? And the English uh, speaker will speak, and the other person uh, will speak. Then this one will speak, and that other one will speak. And I was a woman there. And the woman asked the uh, person sitting by her side, why are they fighting in front of everybody? And her own, it, her own understanding as I talk and you talk and I talk and you talk and I talk and you talk, he said, why if they want to fight, why didn't they go somewhere and fight? Why is it that all of us were here? Is it what we came to see? Why are they fighting in front of everybody? And then the person who she asked said, they are not fighting. You see, that person is preaching. Ah, is, that is preaching. And then the other fellow is interpreting to the language that our people here are okay, I understand now. Now, I thought they were fighting. See that? If we're not conscious of what goes on, and we do not understand how the people interpret what we say, and what we do, and how we do it, we can lose them. That's the reason why we're saying you need to have knowledge of the people you are ministering to. It says you have knowledge in verse 6, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Will not be will not be unfruitful in Jesus' name. To be fruitful, we have to be conscious of how, pe how people think, how people perceive what we do, and it is that they have such virtues that will make us to be the kind of people we ought to be. We're going to be like that in Jesus' name. And let's look at Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles, chapter five. Acts of the Apostles, chapter five. I'm reading from verse one. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, with his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price. Now, here is uh, in another situation, this is even a Jewish situation. But you understand, from Acts chapter 2, everybody sold everything and he brought it to the apostles' feet. It became the culture. It became the expectation. It became the normal thing. It became the regular thing. In the time of Jesus Christ, that was not the expectation. Jesus only told that rich ruler, go sell everything you've got and then give to the poor and come and follow me. But many other people still, Mary and Martha still kept their house. And then Simon the leper still kept his house, and all the other people still kept their houses. He said everything. It was peculiar to just a few people. But now, the people just came to know the Lord. And in that, a kind of joy, excitement of knowing the Lord. See, He gave me salvation. See, I've seen the light. See, I've got redemption. And what, what, why am I keeping this for? This one sold, this one sold, this one sold. It became a tradition. It became something to expect. And then you have Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. Again, everybody still selling everything, having all things common. It became the tradition, became the culture. And here comes somebody that didn't understand that this practice has now become the expected thing and the normal thing. And because he didn't know that, ordinarily, 
if you sold whatever you sold and you brought only half of it or part of it, that's all right, ordinarily. But now because this became the culture there, it says, but part of the price, his wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart? It became like Satan filled my heart. The man has not spoken, has not said anything, but he came and see, I'm following the culture, I'm following the tradition, I'm following the expectation. And Peter said, Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, the man has not spoken anything, he just laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was only part. You see, it was the expectation. And therefore, when you go to places, if you're missionary minded, if you really love the people, you say, What is money? I can lay everything down. Barnabas did it. Other people did it. All those other people, I even got saved before them, they did it. And if that is the norm, if that is the expectation, I can do it. If you don't want to do it, then don't do it at all. Then we will know that you are not part of the expectation, what the people expect. But because it was, uh, you know, he now came. Why, uh, why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, what happened? He fell down. Why did he fall down? Because he himself felt guilty. He felt condemned. He knew that this was you know, a lie. I'm playing. I'm just, just uh, playing here. I'm playing a game here. And he fell down because of that condemnation. And we're told he gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that had these things. What's the implication of that? Great fear came on them that had these things. It means that's the expectation. Do it or die. That's the norm. Do it or die. And if I want to remain here, then this expectation, I have to meet this expectation. Is that part of the gospel? Not really. Not really. And you're going to find after Acts of the Apostles chapter 6, that thing did not continue. When they were scattered everywhere, and then they went, they knew that that wasn't part of the gospel, just the expectation and just the norm at that time. It was a temporary thing. And that's why you need to be very conscious and have knowledge that this is what to do at this particular time. I pray God will give us understanding. I said God will give us understanding. I'm looking now at Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 12. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 12. Here it says in verse 12, it says, Well, for my, bre my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. That was a virtue they had in that early church. And if we're going to be real missionary minded church, that's the virtue we ought to have. That you say, it's not just because I'm in Lagos, it's not just because I'm in, at the headquarters, it's not just because I'm at the headquarters in Nigeria, but when I go to the missionary field, as we have obeyed in the presence of our leadership, then it says, but now much more, much more, much more in my absence, walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I'm going to point number three now. The harmonious voice of a mission-minded church. The harmonious voice of a mission-minded church. If there's anything that uh, makes us really missionary-minded, it means that we're going to be united in fellowship. We're going to be united in doctrine. We're going to be united as we, pro as we proclaim the word of the Lord. And all the things the Lord is telling us, they're teaching us here, we're going to keep to it and God will help us in Jesus' name. Look at Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. I'm reading from verse 1. I'm reading from verse 15. Reading from verse 1, reading from verse 15. You're going to, it says, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garment, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the unclean and uh, the uncircumcised and the unclean. Give me a good amen. That's verse 1, that's verse 1. Look at verse 15. It says, So. Shall he sprinkle many nations, and the kings shall, and the kings shall shut their mouths at him. And then it says, For 
that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. It talks about it in verse 1, awake, awake, put on your beautiful garment. And it says, the unclean shall not enter into us anymore. Amen and amen to that. And then in verse 15, it says, there's going to be growth, there's going to be cleansing, there's going to be success. Between 1 and 15, you're going to find out that the middle point between 1 and 15 is 8. And you find in verse 8, look at verse 8, if what we have read in verse 1, what we have read in verse 15 is going to happen. The pivot, or the fulcrum, or the very center, or the support of all that, that God is going to give us the victory over there on the missionary field is what to read in the middle in verse 8. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, one voice, or the voice together, just united voice, shall they see. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. It's talking about the harmonious voice of a mission-minded church. That is, as we're mission-minded, all that we're reading here, all that we're studying here, all that we're learning here, that say, yes, that is the word. We're ready together, and interpretations given by the Spirit of God, and we know that this is the way to go. And there's nobody saying, well, let them say whatever they want to say. I know my own mind, when I get to the country where I'm coming from, if the people don't do it like this and follow the tradition as well as the Bible teaching, I'm not going to allow them to change me because I am a Yoruba man. And as a Yoruba man, this is where I stand. I'm an Igbo man. And as an Igbo man, this is where I stand. Anybody, what if my father came here to see me? What if my relatives come here and they see me? And they see that I am not of holding the tradition of our people. If you want to be like that, why are you a Christian? If you are like that, why do you go missionary field? If we're going to serve the people, and we're going to bring people into the kingdom, all those pet ideas, all those peculiarities, all those things, we just send them and throw them away. And then we speak with one voice, and when we have been wrong, and we have said, we have seen that what we are doing was hindering the propagation of the gospel, and hindering the progress of the work of God, and hindering the success the Lord wants to give us, we'll say, oh Lord, I'm sorry for that. You know, if you are doing something, for example, that hinders the salvation of people, it doesn't concern you. It hinders people responding to the gospel, it doesn't concern you. It hinders people yielding to the word of the Lord. And the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary means nothing to them because you have added tradition and you are not willing to even give up. Are you not like a Pharisee, like a Sadducee? Because that's what hindered them from getting the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The repentance we are repenting, we are repenting of the things we have been doing, the things we have been saying that will hinder your ministry from being successful. And it is when you do that, well, then we can see eye to eye, and we can speak with one voice to say, "I'm in agreement with that. I didn't know this before. It shocks me that I am the one that has been hindering the propagation of the gospel in the country that I've gone." When we do that, I believe that the power of God will work mightily in our lives in Jesus' name. Did you say Amen? First Corinthians chapter one. I'm reading from verse ten. First Corinthians chapter one. We're looking at verse ten. First Corinthians chapter one, verse ten. The unity we are to have, the harmony we are to have, the togetherness, the fellowship we are to have, and thinking the same way, talking the same way, having the same approach, so that we do not hinder the people that ought to get saved through our ministry. First Corinthians chapter one, verse ten. It says, "Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that she all speak." speak the same thing, that she all speak the same thing, that she all speak the same thing. And then it says, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That's the harmonious voice we're talking about. If we're going to actually reach the people that we need to reach, that harmony, that harmonious voice ought to be there. John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 20. It says, and that the, it says in verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me 
through their word. We shall believe on me through their word. Well, I want to come back uh, to what I was talking about on our appearance. You know, the Jewish people, the way the Jewish people dress is very different from the way Gentiles dress. It's like if somebody came now from Israel and being a man and is not wearing the coat and tie that, you know, the English people wear. This one is coming from the West. This kind of dressing with your coat and tie is coming from UK, it's coming from America. Why? Because they brought the gospel to us. And sometimes we don't make any difference between the gospel they brought and the culture they brought. And you see, they brought their cultures with it. They brought their style of dressing with it. And that's why you want to find in all the Commonwealth countries that were kind of colonial, uh, subs colonially subservient to Europe before, to, to England before. But we need to understand that it's just their culture. And that's what they gave us. They gave us the gospel. They gave us the culture. The fault we have is that we are now going to other countries and we're giving them, we're giving them also the gospel and the culture. We make a difference between those two things. See it over here. Jesus said, I'm praying for them. And then he says what he said, I'm praying for them, for those that will believe through their word, through their word, not their culture. Is the canonicity of the word, the scriptures that they came to give us, those apostles. That's why we've got now. We don't dress like the Jews dress. We don't dress like those Israelites dress, like Paul the apostle, like he dressed. Don't you see? Well, you look at our calendar. Look at the calendars we have. The life calendar. And you see, Gerald, see the pictures there. No coat and tie. Those are, that's Jewish dressing. And you look at it from January to December. And you will see that this is the appearance of the people. Why don't we take that? Because that's their culture. We took the gospel. We take those verses there. We take the prophecies there. But we don't take the kind of dressing we see in that calendar. Because that is not part of the gospel. If then, if those people have been faithful in giving us the gospel and not their culture, it means we too should be faithful and we go to all these places and give them the gospel. The word of God. That Jesus Christ is the Savior. Jesus Christ is the Redeemer. And Jesus is the only Savior. And when they turn away from their sins and they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they are born again, they become new creatures in Christ. The new creature in Christ is not shown by our culture. It's shown by the change of life, change of heart. And the Lord will make them, keep them in the gospel in Jesus' name. Look at verse 21. That they all may be one. The Lord does not give us the luxury of being different, of being distinct, of having our own mind, of saying, I don't accept that. He has prayed for us. He said, we as a church, that they all may be one. Then he goes on to say, as thou Father art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Our unity, when we are not opposing each other, when we are not sharing apart the message, we are not pushing down the word of God, we are not saying, because we have never, we have never done like that before. But now they are saying this and they are saying that, I don't accept that. When there is no disunity or this kind of conflict, then it says the world all will believe. I pray that will bring the world to the Lord in Jesus' name. I'm looking at uh, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. We're looking at verse 27. Philippians chapter 1. I'm looking at verse 27. Philippians 1. Verse 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your I may hear of your of your fears that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the face of the gospel. One mind. One mind. That means that your mind is just like my mind. My mind is just like your mind. And we're thinking together. We're going the same way, the same direction. And we have the same word of God. We have the same understanding. And if God has given me this insight, has given me this interpretation, and you can see black and white in the word of God, if you, have, if you happen to be different, I didn't think like that before. I didn't see that before. But thank you, Lord, because you've given us a teacher, you've given us a leader that can show us the way, and we're going to follow. And when we 
we all bind ourselves together, the same mind and the same will and the same motive and the same direction, the same focus and the same passion and the same orientation. I believe that the world will yield to the gospel in Jesus' name. You want to pray that there is nothing in your life, nothing in your approach, nothing in your attitude, nothing you are holding on to that will not allow the gospel, the gift God has given us and this grace of God, the gospel, the Lord has given us to reach out to people that whatever it is in us that will hinder the salvation and the eternal destiny of anybody in heaven, whatever it is in us that will hinder that, we're going to throw them away in Jesus' name. Can't I throw away something convenient, something comfortable for me? Can't I throw away something pleasant to me just to make sure that people that I'm speaking to, that they get to heaven? Why is it I'm thinking of my convenience, I'm thinking of my comfort more than the salvation of the people? If we will think of salvation of the people, how do they see this? How do they accept this, this, this idea? Then we'll be able to reach out to people and we're going to have the church growing in every country in Jesus' name. You see, many people, they think that, you know, the church cannot grow in other countries. But thank God, in some of our countries where we have gone, the church is growing. But in some of the countries where, we're, where we are, the church is not growing. I mean, people like Bible Church, we're not growing. And it is because of this thing we're talking about. And if God will release us today, I believe will release us. And then we lay everything on the altar and say, Lord, for the sake of perishing souls, in these places we're coming from, oh Lord, I'm going to give of anything that will hinder the propagation of the gospel. I believe the Lord will respect and honor your consecration and your commitment. He will reward you for it in Jesus' name. So that those of us who are from America, you understand the things that the national Nigerian culture to give up so that we can move forward. And those of us from Europe, from England, we give up things that we need to give up that will just preserve the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're not, you know, there's some of us here, yeah, they're so in mature. Let's say, for example, they go to our church in America, or they go to our church in uh, maybe in England or Europe, and then they see some things, some superficial things that our brethren are trying to do so that they can reach out to the people there. They come over here, they will tell their friends, there's no deeper life in UK, there's no deeper life in Europe, there's no deeper life in America. What do you mean? You, you know, I, I got there. You know what I saw? I saw that they put the picture of uh, the GS, they put it in a particular conspicuous place, <laughs> and they worship in uh, the GS, what are they doing that for? Other people say, I saw this one, I saw that one. It's immaturity. The, the way things are done over, oh, I went to a particular church, you know, that day, you know what they were talking about? They say it is Mother's Day, and then they were saying, all the mothers there, now you come to this side, we on, they told them to stand up, and then they said, we honor you, mothers. And I was looking at them like this and say, huh? Deeper life. That they said Mother's Day. I went to another church, you know. I, I don't know why I'm so lucky to meet all these things. They modeled up everything. They have destroyed the palace church. They said today is Father's Day. How many of you are fathers here? We honor you. And they started giving them cars. Think about that in the palace Bible. Church. Uh -uh. The palace Bible. They gave them cars. And they gave them this and then other places is the Christmas card. That's what irritates them. Why don't you become so mature and understand that that's the way it's done over there. In some countries, they have Thanksgiving Day as a big deal in that country. And believers make programs and they project that. And they say, we're going to use this so as to win the people. We think like them and we act like them. They're not committing sin. They're still going to preach the gospel. Also, they come more matured in our church over here. I said we're going to come more mature in our church over here. And so that we'll be able to preach the gospel at every opportunity. And become all things to all men. And become this dynamic, mission-minded churches. So that everywhere we go, deep and live, Bible church will thrive and grow and succeed. In every church in Jesus' name. In every country in Jesus' name. In your country in particular, in your location in particular. This church will grow and this church will expand. God is going to give you a breakthrough in Jesus' name. If you are broken, if you are broken, you are going to have a breakthrough. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. We are going to present all this before the Lord. And we are going to tell the Lord, O oh Lord, here we are. O oh Lord, here we are. Break me. Melt me. Mold me once again. And make me a vessel unto honor. Whichever country you are. Let's become missionary minded. Missionary minded, missionary minded, 
that all the things that appear to be Yoruba culture, Igbo culture, Hausa culture, Fulani culture, Ibibio culture, Efi culture, push all that aside and let's concentrate on preaching the pure gospel. Not mixed with culture, not mixed with tradition, not mixed with, you know, the way they do this, the way they do that. Let's preach the gospel and have the gospel given unto the people without any string attached and without any kind of limitation. And the word of God will reach out to them in Jesus' dynamic, mission-minded churches. Open your mouth and pray. Open your mouth and pray. I understand you might be tired, but, you know, kind of consecrate your tiredness and say, Lord, we're going to reach the uh, people of our community more, people of our country more. And then we have real deeper life based on the gospel, based on the word of God, and based on this pure gospel, on adulterated gospel. We'll push all the traditions aside. I dress differently and appear differently and speak different languages, but it's going to be the same, the same, the same gospel. Help, tell the Lord to help you. Tell the Lord to help you. Over there, brothers and sisters at the DLCC, uh, let the moderator take over now and lead us until 9 o'clock, until 9 o'clock. Lead us in prayer so that all these things will sink in, in our heart, in our soul, in our mind. And then we'll do what we ought to do over here to you. We're going to call on Pastor Adina to please uh, keep and, uh, come and lead us in prayer until 9 o'clock so that this word will get deep into us and we're going to work on it and we're going to live as it wants us to live. Brethren, let us really call upon the Lord.